This is that lake, was it last year? Might have been last year, last fall or the fall before. And I've drone videotaped that huge snow avalanche that came down in a lake. Whew. And that was just about, uh, just around that next point where that slide was. On the Duffy Lake Highway right now, there's checkpoints at either end because of the landslides from the flooding here in BC last week. Anyway, it's snowing. It's not that cold here. Not as cold as where I was previously. Let's we'll see if I can get something going here. If there's not too much traffic. There's too much traffic in a bail. You, the U.S. Forest Service knows all about Sabe. Straight up, yes they do. Dear Steve, I've watched your show for over a year. The more I hear the stories, the more it makes me remember other non-sighting encounters before my actual sightings. These happened while I was working as a wildland firefighter for the U.S. Forest Service. The whoops and knocking across the lake in the 70s was always explained to us kids as drunk hippies, as it was that time in Northern California. We live in the San Francisco Bay Area, and we're in the Sierras, and we're in the Sierras all year round as we had a cabin at 6,000 feet in elevation, skiing in the winter, the lake and fish in the spring and summers, deer hunting and wood cutting in the fall and early winter. After high school in 84, I moved up to our cabin to get away from the city. Of course, work is seasonal. We split our year between working at the ski resort in the winter and firefighting May through October. Sounds great when you're 19. My first year was 1985 with the U.S. Forest Service, USDA, Department of Agriculture. I won the job of Lead Sawyer on a 30-man team. We were a hand crew and went where bulldozers and trucks couldn't go, either by humping in or by helicopter, usually wilderness areas that have never been logged and therefore have no fire roads. The area of my particular forest, the Stanislaus National Forest occupies, contains the emigrant wilderness, where Ron Moorhead recorded the Sierra Sounds. My first of three encounters occurred a few hours to the north in the Plumas National Forest, in which the town of Quincy is located. The main fire camp was at the local fairgrounds where the different teams from around the country gathered to organize for the fight. Our team drew a hell attack mission several miles beyond any type of road into an old growth wilderness area. We split the 30 man team to fight two separate dry lightning strikes, each about an acre. It takes four trips to the ferry, the entire team in. Being Lead Sawyer, I was always the first in the first flight with my one of with my one of my crew leaders to assess the approach and fell any trees needed to create rotor clearance. Sometimes that meant rappelling down and lowering by saw my saw by rope. I fell two trees and the LZ was open. John, my crew leader, a First Nation Miwok tribe member, and I started to establish the approach trying tying ribbon and limbing up trees so the remainder of the crew could easily follow. Very easy fire as half a crew had hours out and cold before total dark. The plan is to bivouac and keep an eye on the burn till morning when the birds would pick us up. This area is beautiful giant old growth forest. Barely any moonlight reaching through the massive trees to the forest floor. The 15 of us took out our space blankets and found a good tree to bed up against. Being exhausted we were all fast asleep in no time. It was around 3.30 a.m. when I woke, bolt awake, looking at the outline of an eight to nine foot creature covered in dark hair, not fur, but hair as you could see it move. Years of hunting over the Sierra and Nevada mountains told me this was not a bear. I started to reach for my chainsaw when I literally could not move. It felt like I was being held on every part of my body. I got effing pissed and wanted to cut the bastard off of the knees. That's when he turned and looked at me with I swear to God red glowing eyes. I never was scared. I was pissed and started mind speaking to the big bully to let me go and give me a shot. He then looked at me as an older man would look at a 19 year old and as clear as day without making an audible sound he said, thank you for taking care of our home, you are a friend. I immediately felt calm and we stared at each other for over a very long minute or two. He had a human face, only a beard. He was four feet wide at the shoulders and his hair hid any neck he might have had. His nose was turned down human-like and his arms were long and hands hanging below his knees. He was standing very erect and human-like, shoulders back, chest forward. He was ripped and I knew the chainsaw was probably a bad idea. He was definitely a male, definitely. He was four feet from me and he could have reached out and grabbed me at any time. I started to listen with my ears 
and everyone was snoring or breathing normal sleeping sounds. I looked back at him and he honestly gave me a polite nod, turned and took three or four easy steps, which made no noise and carried him on unreasonable distance, where it passed between two trees, at which point he just vanished and where he had been looked where he had been looked like the transporter sparkles from the Star Trek episode. No shit, beam me up Scotty shit. Dead quiet. He never made a sound. I heard a guy sleeping four feet away start whimpering quietly, and the guy next to him made a noise that only could be him shitting his pants. I stayed up and quiet till I got till I got purple, till it got purple in the eastern sky and went to piss a ways off. I turned when done and standing right behind me was my crew boss John. He was looking at me very serious and in two words said, who else? I told about the two guys and this is where Sabe and the government effed with my life and freedoms. I was sternly ordered to very quietly get the other two guys and meet him back here while he sent the rest of the crew to prep the LZ for the choppers. When he walked up and held up his hand and told us not to speak, he advised us that as employees of the federal government, we now had top secret clearances and were never to speak to anyone of the bear encounter, not even between us. I begged him to answer just answer, I begged him to just answer a question each. He looked at me disappointed and walked away to meet the choppers. While the three of us made our way to the meadow, I tried to speak with my teammates to no avail. They would not utter a word, both clearly in shock. We made the chopper ride back to town where the three of independently got to meet top FS brass and for real men in black. After a lengthy debrief and some very scary warnings, I headed for the showers and the chow. Both my team members was told to, was told, took sick, and were sent home due to smoke inhalation. I saw that I was going to shut up. Leavenworth Supermax didn't sound too inviting. When we left Quincy, we traveled back to our forest to work around there and await the next fire call. I tried to act normal, but felt like everyone knew my secret. It took a while to relax my own skin again. Number two, mid-fire season, we were called to go south a couple hours to the Sierra National Forest east of, east of Fresno, near Sequoia and Yosemite National Park. David will appreciate that fact. The fire was slow moving, so my crew boss, John, and I hiked up a ridge across the canyon from the burn, that's slowly moving up the opposite ridge through a stand of trees. Along its left side was a logged area that ran to the top, but was a strip with a strand of trees on its left. Standing in the middle of the log strip, halfway up the ridge, was an eight to nine foot tall sabe, reddish brown, standing there, assessing the fire just as we were. All I could think of was how the bully had me down with his freeze ray the last time we met. I put as much concentration into broadcasting one very clear thought to this bastard. F you. We were at least 450 yards away in a tree line across the canyon, and he looked at me directly. He gave me a slight wave by, way, by raising his hand, took another look at the fire, and then turned towards the opposite stand of trees, and wow, he covered the 300-yard side hill to the opposite stand of trees in a time and speed that was not physically possible by the physics that we understand to date. The weirdest part was that he looked like he was gliding, each stride covering huge distances. Then, as before, when he passed into the tree line, he just vanished followed by two blue softball-sized orbs. It was midday and it was very clear with all the smoke traveling up over the ridge. I turned and looked at John, who just smiled at me and said, What do you think of that bear? It didn't mind speak to us so much as send a thankful feeling, very empathetic. I wouldn't want to be on this giant effer's bad side. <clears throat> Nothing was said between us, but again, it didn't frighten me so much as amaze me and make me very angry at the assholes who've been letting me run around the forest since five without telling me that the boogeyman was effing real. The last occasion to work with our fellow protectors of the forest came midway through my second fire season. We were dispatched to Yosemite, which shares a border with our home forest. We grouped at the top of the glacial point at the ski area for helicopter operations. Being in the first sortie, I got a real ride. I got a great ride, dropping over Glacier Point and going straight towards the valley floor. The pilot, pulling level at 500 feet and banked off El Capitan and circled towards Bridal Veil Falls where the fire was located. On this fire, I had to rappel down and have my saw lowered. The boss made a couple sweeps while I felled trees, giving us the clearance for the rotors. I'd already started to move up the slope towards the fire tying ribbon and limbing up trees. 
I came over a rise and standing 20 feet away was another Sabe. I started to laugh my ass up because he had this silly smile on his face. He in some way communicated that I had met his kin, as was welcome. He had me follow him up a route I would never have seen. I was in a perfect spot to start the initial attack on the burn line. I heard the crew coming up my trail. When John came over, all he said was, Gotta love those bears, huh? Those are the official slash unofficial encounters that officially I'm not supposed to talk about. Screw it. I'll call it a day here, but have some rather effed up stories about where my top secret clearance took me in the service of our nation. Thank you and all other brave souls for giving me the courage to right the wrongs I can. Loving your new place, but really miss Mr. Macaroni. The goat is doing pretty good at taking up some, some of that empty space we feel when losing a family member. Wow, I really feel better getting that off my chest. You love the other shit they have been lying to us about. Stay solid, Steve. Your army of truth is behind you. Respectfully. Did you say I could use your name? <clears throat> Respectfully, Jason Walter, member of the club. Holy shit, Jason, that's a frickin' chunk, right? You got more, you come and, sh you come and share it with me, all right? Share it with all the people through me. Let's get it out, okay? That's quite the chunk of information there, Jason. You make sure you send us more, all right? Any chance you get, you send it over. I wanna hear it all. Anything you have that you can share with the people, share it, okay? And you're right, it's about the people enough of this bullshit. Covering up, covering it up for who, you know? Being scared of who? F them. We gotta get all this information out to the people, that's all there is to it. And that's what we're doing, right? Obviously. Anyway, I'm fairly frozen again. Time to get out here. I'm gonna get up at five o'clock in the morning and climb up my coastal mountains now and get some of those SD cards out of cameras and have a little snoop and adventure here. Yep. Well, that was fun. <laughs> Doesn't look like fun to lots of you, but trust me, it was fun. That's what I needed today. I needed to, uh, I just needed to go up one of my favorite hills, hunt it properly, possibly get a chance at a mature buck, or not. And I, I managed to get in a bow range of a young buck, videotaped him, that was pretty cool. I'm good. Full blizzard. I guess it's going to mean uh, chronic rain coming for a lot of British Columbia, which isn't too good. Okay, how come these are fogging up a second ago? So this will be uh, my last share for the mountains here for the year. I'll probably till springtime when I come up to get all these cameras. I gotta miss this place, man. I've been running around these mountains for a long time. This is tough when it's just barfing wet snow. Whatever, I'm gonna do this. Now, there's so many. What do we got? No Bigfoot story. All right, well, what do you got? I'm Jason. I've lived in Eastern Panhandle of West Virginia all my life. Never been much of a hunter, but was an avid fisherman for many years of my life. So I spent many so I spent my share of time in the woods and camping. I've never witnessing, witnessed anything close to what many claim. It's blew my mind the amount of people telling other encounters on your site and others. I'm curious about something and I want to ask you a question. 
What is the closest to Washington, D.C. that an encounter related to Bigfoot has been reported? About two hours from D.C. and Baltimore. I've never heard a report that's credible even close to the Northern Virginia, Maryland, Eastern Shore, or D.C. areas. This seems strange to me, but since our great government has been lying and withholding info to us, maybe they purposely keep the populations away from this area. Probably the closest sightings I'm aware of is Central or Southern Virginia, up in Pennsylvania, Allegheny Highlands, in West Virginia, Blue Ridge Mountains, which are, only, which are mostly Virginia. I think it's a shame our government has kept this from us. It's ruined a lot of people's lives. We need educated. We need educated on this topic. Thanks for all you do. This world needs more like you. At least now, if I ever do encounter one, then I'll hope I know what to do. The feeling of dread and being terrified is not something I want to experience. When you have time, see what the closest encounter to DC area that you can find. I have a feeling this is just may help us to find a couple more answers. Thank you, Jason B. Okay, thanks, Jason. Um, the best place now that we've read your email is going to be in the comment section below for sure okay so keep an eye down there somebody from that area has seen something they're going to put it they're going to comment in the comment section guaranteed all right two encounters one photo interdimensional being 20 minutes from downtown nashville so keep this quick and straight to the facts January 2021, I was behind my house 20 minutes outside of Nashville in Scottsboro around 10, 11 p.m. I was living on a rural road, mostly farms, with about 1,000 acres of woods behind my house, very hilly with many creeks. I was using a new deer collar I got for Christmas for my girlfriend. Three does came from a field behind my neighbor's house, walked up to 20 feet of me. I couldn't believe how close they were coming. Next thing I know, I hear what sounds like rocks being clicked together in intervals of five clicks, then a three to five second pause, and five more clicks. The sound was coming from the right in front of me in the woods, where it was very, very thick and dark. While the does were waking up from my left from a completely cleared field. Walking up from my left. It happened about four or five times and I got spooked and went inside. I was trying to find out what the hell could make a noise like that. It was very clear and crisp and pretty loud. Also, I was smelling a very strong, wet dog smell, but I was initially attributing that to deer not far away. Anyway, it was strange, and more and more I feel like it was something strange, especially after what had happened later. Come October 2021, someone five doors down has a being doing a bunch of wood knocking at 5 to 6 a.m. when they were letting their dog out in the morning and throwing a lot of rocks into a creek slash pond right next to the house. They thought it was something big crashing through the woods at first, like a bear, till the wood knocking and rocks started to happen. They've also have some woods behind them as where I was living. Within the same week as the wood knocks and the rock throwing, my buddy three doors the opposite way, same street, finds a strange picture on a trail camper behind his house. Some woods, it looks like a ghost or just a white blur, sent it to me and the more I looked at it, I noticed a face, no shit. 100% clear face, a big ass mouth with a bunch of teeth being shown and big eyes. Once you see the teeth, it's very clear to see even for someone like you. Once I showed them, they all just said, holy shit, it's insane. Please load the photos. I'd like to see if anyone has seen anything similar to the, and knows what the hell it is. If you can upload them, I'll try to make an account to post in the comments and upload them somewhere so some, some people can view them. Here's a photo from the trail cam just normally like a deer. Here is one of the ghosts being thing, just ignore the shape of the apparition and look center mass, you'll see the teeth and the eyes. I shit you not, zoom in and you'll see it. Here is a zoomed photo. This photo is no way messed with or altered. It is sent straight to me from the guy who has the trail camps. Those boys don't even know what Photoshop is. They just want to hunt and have fun in the woods and not be scared. I watch all your videos, so hope to hear it read. Let's hear more in, info from guys like Owl Man. We all need puzzle pieces. Thank you for spreading the truth. We need more of it. If you need anything or have any questions, just reply. All right, what do we got? I guess, uh oh, they're not loading on here. Oh, there we go, okay. Uh, all right, well, this video is gonna be edited on the editing program, so I'll remember to uh, Oh, yeah, that's creepier than shit. I'll I'll get these edited up and stuck on there. So what do we got? I can comment on it right now. There's a deer, a tree, nice buck walking through. 
I guess those are examples of the previous the trail camera, and there's the apparition. It's very bizarre. And like you said, when you look in close, you can see teeth. <laughs> that is very weird, man. Very, very weird. What do you say about that? Nothing I can say about it. It's just, there's the photos. There's what you see. Take from it what you will or leave it. Very bizarre, man. Thanks for sending that in. Very bizarre. All right, what do we got here? Hi, Steven, subscriber to your channel for a couple years now. I'd like to first say thank you for what you're doing for the people out there that have been ridiculed for telling your stories. What you're doing is noble, and I admire your willingness to be our voice. My late father and I had an occurrence happen when he and I were fishing at Bonaparte Lake in the Okanagan Forest in Washington State. The location is just above the little towns of Tanasket and Oroville, Washington, and just south of the Canadian border in British Columbia. We had rented a small boat and a cabin on the lake back in either 88 or 89. On the second day, he and I decided to try some fishing before dark. We were trolling spinners for rainbow trout behind the boat at about 7 p.m. It had been a nice sunny day with just a slight wind, maybe 45 miles per hour. We would circle the shoreline as we trolled the lake in a clockwise direction. The lake is maybe a mile long by half mile wide. The fishing sucked as we were not catching any fish on the summer day. I was operating the motor and looking over my father's shoulder when I noticed something big flying through the air, then making a giant splash into the lake approximately 100 yards in front of us, and at least 75 feet from the shore. I looked toward the thick pine trees where it had come from, but saw nothing. My dad said it had to be a big fish, but I argued with him, telling him I know what I saw, and tried explaining what appeared to be a very large rock flying through the air. There was no one around this particular part of the lake because the fishing season was winding down and was the rural part of the lake where you never see anyone on the shoreline. We continued to troll the bank as we made our circle, headed back toward the lodge, then back up the shoreline where we were just at about 20 minutes, half an hour before. It was just starting to get dark and we agreed this would be our last time around the lake for the evening. As we trolled the shoreline near where I saw the rock slash object fly to the air, we heard three super, super loud whacks of what sounded like wood on wood, then snapping of limbs to the left of where the sound appeared to be coming from, then nothing. Complete quiet. Not knowing exactly what to think, we both just stared at where the sound came from. Then, at each other, without saying a word, we got to about 15 to 20 feet or so from where I saw the splash, when behind the boat to my back, not even 10 feet, was another gigantic splash. It was large enough that it got my t-shirt soaked from the splash. That sucks. It scared the shit out of both of us. My dad just happened to be looking in the other direction toward the woods where the loud smacks and cracks had just come from at that time, so did not see anything fly through the air, but agreed it sounded like an object, not a fish. The following days were uneventful. <clears throat> I know what I saw that day. I also know that no human could physically launch a stone that size as far out into the water from any angle of the bank and there was no one else anywhere around. We then heard a muffled groan sound coming from the woods there. I turned and saw the look on my dad's face and went full throttle back to the cabin. My mother and sister to this day think we were pulling their legs and telling a story, excuse me, as they were at the cabin cooking dinner at the time. We stayed the next couple nights but had no other encounters. As we checked out, I happened to mention what had happened to us to the guy in the little store. He just kind of chuckled and looked away, but said nothing. But no one has ever believed me when I tell them what happened, and usually accuses me of being high on drugs. Not the case. It happened. Go ahead and use our names if you want, and please tell our story in memory of my father. His name is Jim S., and I am his son, Scott S. Thank you again for doing what you do. I hope we can learn more about these creatures or whatever they are in our lifetimes. I think of that day often, and have been stuck on any information I can find on the subject of Bigfoot slash Sasquatch ever since. Thanks, Steve Godspeed. Scott S. Kennewick, Washington. Uh, how many times have we heard about fishermen getting boulders chucked at them? That's endless. It's not a very nice thing to do, really, right? I mean, it's not like it's a spawning salmon run with a huge... Uh, important food staple going on right in that body of water for the damn things. It's not like you're screwing them up with anything, so obviously they're just doing it to mess with you. But I guess if I was one of them and I seen some guys trout fishing, like I'd probably do the same thing, right? 
Why not? Funnier than shit if you're a Sasquatch, see some fishermen out there and soak them with boulders from the timber without them seeing and watching the looks on their face and peeing your frickin' furry pants laughing. It's funny, I wonder what's gonna happen when I'm sitting here reading these emails, right? I mean, I'm right in the heart of it right now. But I've already said my, I've already said my spiel to them in the dark and I, on the way up the mountain. Just leave me alone. Stay away from me and leave me alone. Just want to go hunting. And that's it. That'll be the last video from my one of my most favorite places in the whole world, right here. I'll be back in the spring. Collect up all my cameras and see all the goodies that are on there. It's a beautiful, healthy place here, man. Anyway, here I go. Gotta go. Oh, gotta go back to the other home. Pack up all my stuff. And then drive two hours. The ferry, take an hour, 40 minute ferry ride, and then drive another 45 minutes. And I will be home at last. It's like, it's like, it's been like a never ending movie. <laughs> it's just never ending. It's like I'm never gonna get home. Oh, here we go. Keep sending them in, you guys. Keep sending them in.